And summer of 69 was always an interesting thing because people, would, critics would go, well, geez, what? You must have been just a child in 69. Yeah. Goes, That's, it's not about the year 69. <laughs> So let's talk about Reckless. Which album in, in the cycle was it that you did with Well, that was the third one that I third produced. One. It was You Want It, You Got It, which was the first one. It had a song called Lonely Nights on it, which is a sort of a minor radio hit. It was a bit of a radio hit. Yeah, I remember. And uh, that was actually his second album. The first one, nobody even knew about. It was just Canadian, basically, that he did with his uh, writing partner, Jim Valance. But the, the, so it was You Want It, You Got It. It was a pretty good record, I think. But then it was uh, Cuts Like a Knife was the next one. And then Reckless, which is, the, that was the big one. How did you end up working with him? What was the... Well, it was a really clever A&R guy at a and Records, to be honest. He had done his first record, which nobody much cared about. It was, it, you know, it was sort of partly a disco record and partly a, a rock record, and nobody knew what it was, you know? And so it was kind of unfocused, because those guys were just writing songs together, but they were thinking they were writing for other bands quite a bit. So they ended up making a Brian Adams record. He decided he, he, he's got to figure something out and do something better. And so uh, there was a guy named at AM Records named uh, Michael Kirschenbaum, who I had worked with at Power Station on another, a record that he had produced. And we got along real well. And so he, he, Brian asked him, went to LA and said, well, what should I do? So we'll call this guy. He came to New York. We had this little meeting. I was working with Ian Hunter at the time, I think. Incredible. From Mott Mot Hoople. Remember? And uh, so I just finished that session. I had this meeting with Brian and, and they were, wa Ian was walking out. And uh, so I was introducing Brian to Ian. I said, I said, uh, oh, Ian, this is, uh, and I said, what did you say your name was? And I forgot <laughs> his name. Of course, I forget everybody's name. Yeah. But um, it was so funny because Brian will never let me live that down. Yeah. <laughs> he said, you remember my name yet? I've, do, you, do you remember what my name is? Anyway, we hit it off, and I just liked his songs. I thought, well, these are really nice little pop rock songs, you know, and they're very catchy. And he seemed like a nice guy. So he went back to Vancouver, and he said, uh, he calls me up, and he says, listen, I have a little problem. And this is two weeks before we were supposed to start the record. He goes, I, I just fired my band. <laughs> and I guess he had some musicians he was working with, but he just didn't like what they were doing. He says, you have any, any ideas for musicians? And so, well, yeah, sure. I had done a G.E. Smith record. Remember G.E. Smith? Of course, from the Saturday Night Live band. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And uh, I had co-produced a record with him. And his band was really good. It was Mickey Curry on drums, who was amazing. And I loved Mickey. Tommy Mandel on organ. And he was from a band called The Shirts, a punk band that I used to go see at CBGB, it's called The Shirts. And then a bass player, Brian Stanley, who was a bass player, he was a New York guy. And so I got them, we went into rehearsal and he loved them and it just was great. He didn't have a guitar, he, didn't, he was the only guitar player, he didn't have a lead guitar player. And uh, so we did that record and then we had to try out guitar players. And so we tried G.E. Smith, uh, that, you know, he came to, he was a good friend of mine, so he came to the top of the, uh, my mind, and that didn't work out. And he tried, tried a few other people. Brian ended up playing lead guitar on that album because we couldn't find anybody. So Brian's playing all the lead guitar on this record? On on the first record. On the first record, oh. Right. Yeah, on, uh, yeah. Uh, on You Want It, You Got It. Yeah. But then we did Reckless, and he, he got uh, Keith Scott from his hometown in Vancouver, who was amazing. Amazing guitar. Still is. And then, uh, and then Reckless. And the thing about Reckless is funny. You reminded me what you were saying how... At one point, you were not sleeping and working all the time. Yep, yep. And well, that was that period for me where I was uh, producing, co-producing with Brian at night most of the time, and then Hall and Oates during the day, wow. doing the Big Bang Boom album. And I remember we were, at the time we were working on Electric Lady, and Brian will be waiting out in the lounge while Hall. Was this for Reckless? For Reckless, while while Daryl and John were leaving. This is sort of the last few weeks of Reckless. But still, just the idea that, you know, you're double... Oh, yeah, I know. Double teaming, like, two, these two massively huge records. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know, and not sleeping. You know, we'd work... I'd work with Brian until 4 or 5 in the morning or, or later, 
and then be back at Electric Lady. Were you sleeping on the studio couch? I think a couple of nights I did, you know, but I mean, I lived right, I was on my bike, I'd ride my bike back up to the Upper West Side and, uh, you know, sleep for a couple hours and come back, you know. <laughs> Those are the days. Yeah. You know, they were pretty good records and Reckless was, that was a not easy record to make because Cuss Like a Knife was pretty successful. Yep. And so we were trying to outdo it. We were trying to beat it. I knew we had the songs. Question, there were a couple of questionables run to you. I think he was, he actually writ, wrote it for another Vancouver band and he wasn't sure whether he wanted to done the album. I said, dude, it has <laughs> got to go on the album. It's because that was my favorite song. And then Summer 69, we cut it and it, it just didn't work. And we recut, we actually recut it because, uh, and changed the arrangement. We went back in, into rehearsal. The two of us worked on the arrangement. I think Jim Valance was involved too, who co-wrote it. And uh, we came up with a whole new arrangement and did it. And what was the first version like? It was more, it didn't grow, you know what I mean? It just kind of sat there and it, it, it wasn't as exciting. I think it wasn't, it was slower tempo. And I can't remember exactly what it was, but because if you listen to the lyric, it's a progression, you know, it starts, you know, my first real six, I bought my first real six, six string and, you know, and it's kind of this story about his life and how the music changed over the, it's a pretty interesting lyric, really. It's a great lyric, yeah. To me, the interesting part was at, at, after the solo, after the bridge and the solo, um, now times have changed. It, look at everything that's come and gone. And all of a sudden, the, you, all of a sudden you start to hear synthesizers. You know, which doesn't happen in the whole first part of the song. I don't know, not, not many people ever notice that. And it's just something that I actually added. I said, let's put a, let's put some real more modern for the time, modern sounds. Mm -hmm. In the end, it sounds like it's now it's, now it's present day, you know? Right, right. And so we kind of changed it that way. But it's like a freight train from the beginning because just that, that just driving guitar, even though it's on its own. That was the thing, the whole, the whole thing hit harder. Yeah. And uh, I remember doing the, redoing the guitar several times to make sure we just got the right exact thing. We worked really hard on it. Do you remember what the guitar? What, what anything about that guitar chain? Oh, Such geez. a great guitar sound. Well, they were Strats mostly, I think, and uh, we just used these little Fender amps. I mean, there were no no big Marshalls or anything like that. You know, I think we used whatever the amp was in the studio. <laughs> and what studio were you at? We originally cut it in Vancouver at Little Mountain, I believe, and then we recut it at Power Station. You know, so that version was done, done at Power Station. There's a couple other songs like um, Somebody. That's that's the one. Yeah. That, uh, Somebody. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just love that. But we mixed. I mixed that six Not times. Not singles. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> mixed that six times in, I think, three different studios. I just kept recalling it. <laughs> I think the final version ended up from Electric Lady, maybe. Well, when you were recalling the mixes, was there a reason why? Just little things, you know, we'd go back and listen and go, no, there's something not quite there. Still, to this day, there's one drum fill that I still, I still miss when I hear it back. <laughs> <laughs> one Night Love Affair, that, that was one of my favorite songs in the album. I thought that was great, besides Run To You. With that, we had to recut the drums for whatever reason. Brian wasn't happy with the, what Mickey did, I think. I think we added some more fills or something. I'm not sure, but we did. We cut, ended up with uh, Pat Stewart from Vancouver, who actually played on these recuts. Fantastic. The local local drummer from Brian's hometown. That's it. And then an album after that, which is really my favorite album, which is called Into the Fire, which wasn't as popular. But there's, I think, those are some of the best songs he's he's written. I mean, they were a bit a bit deeper, you know, kind of not just love songs, but. Uh, some interesting topics in there. Native song. Native song, yeah, it's about in Indians. Because he's Canadian, yeah. he he felt strongly about how the the native Canadians were treated and that mm -hmm. he felt that they were being mistreated. Well, I did a, um, a little seminar at Full Sail. They're this big room at Full Sail. A, yeah. It's a pretty big, huge place. So they had most of the kids in there. The guy that was interviewing me, it was just a, like a, an inner, like this, actually, but in front of a bunch of people on a stage. Before he brought me out, he, he said, okay, as an introduction, what I've done is I've printed out the credits on computer paper, so it was like one of those spooling things. The sort of 
pale green, white, pale green with all yeah, of the... All, it's all hooked together, yeah, you know, all the yeah, papers. Yeah. He picked one of the kids to come up and grab one end of it. And they pulled it all the way to the back of the auditorium. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was this, this long, yeah. you know, just showing my credits. Amazing. From, probably from uh, All Music Guide, I'm sure. So there's a lot of extra stuff in there. There's like compilations yeah. And, yeah, and a lot of repeats, but I thought it was pretty funny. <laughs> But that, that counts because it means that you worked on a song that was successful enough to get into a compilation. Yeah, yeah. that's a good point. Yeah. Never looked at it that way, yeah. but yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's just I've been doing it for so long, you know. <laughs> You've been doing it at the highest level for so long. That's the bottom line. Very lucky. Yes. Well, if, you know, I, I started at exactly the right time for what I wanted to do. Right. I mean, be able to not go to recording school and get a job in a major recording studio in New York yeah. off the bat like that and then just do real I did really well right you know off the bat it was exactly the right thing right for my town what's that that book that somebody wrote a book about that about being a you know having the right talents for the oh time. yeah well outliers because he talks outliers, about yeah. how all the all the like jobs and and Wozniak and yeah. uh, and Bill Gates all grew up in exactly the same time right and all went there was a university that was First, a kind of I'm ruining this JavaScript on Java, Something and like that, so they yeah. learned it at like 11 or 12 years old in yeah. night classes, and they all had the right exact thing yeah. thing going on in their brains, right? For with the right what, opportunities, what they wanted, and exactly the right opportunities. And it was, I mean, obviously I'm no Bill Gates or Steve Jobs, but, right? But you might be our musical equivalent. <laughs> but but uh, you know, for what I could do and what I knew and what I I enjoyed. You know, things couldn't have been better, you know, and unfortunately nowadays it's it's so much more difficult to for that to happen, I think. Well, Jack always says, Jack Douglas always says, he goes, Bob Clear Mountain invented Superstar Mixes. Really? Jack Douglas said <laughs> yeah. that? Wow. Yeah. Well, he invented Superstar Producers. How about that, you know? <laughs> no, I think He's made that, some pretty great records. He said that uh, he recalls, like, Bruce Springsteen in one room, Aerosmith in another, and you... Was it either upstairs or in another room mixing? Probably. And Bruce was falling behind. Yeah. And it was like, well, maybe Bob can start mixing. <laughs> and that, that to his mind, was like the beginning of it all. Like, you know. Could be. Is yeah. that kind of a... A lot of times I wasn't aware of what, that kind of thing. You know, it's just, okay, you know, I'm, I look in the book. Oh, I see I'm booked on this. Springsteen. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Could be. I mean, there was a lot. Power Station, there was a lot going there because there were three rooms. And, you know, I always had, usually had the, the room upstairs, the, the Studio C room, and there were, who knows what was going on. Sounds true, because he said to me, you were upstairs, yeah, they were right. downstairs, both making records. Yeah, yeah, that'd be right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know what record that would have been. I might have been born in the USA. Yeah, it it's funny, because all, 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 the, all the guys, I live in LA, but all the guys that I'm like close to and the work I admire, like Jack and Ch Jay Messina, I'm good yeah. friends with, you know, these are all great. Yourself, or all New Yorkers. Yeah, they were the record plant, New York yeah. record plant guys, mainly. You're all New Yorkers, yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. I think there's also that affinity in the UK because um, we grew up loving kind of punk and R&B and disco, and it's that weird, more New York. and it's all New York. Yeah. 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 It's kind of that combo, you, know, you can get, you can listen to Patti Smith and Chic, in our mind, that makes perfect sense. Sure, yeah, right. That's where you get bands like in England, uh, uh, you know, Gang of Four. Yeah. Punk band with a disco beat. Right. There you go. And then all the new wave and post-punk. I mean, the Blondie, Television, Talking Heads. Yeah. Yeah. And the Ramones. Ramones, of course, yeah. Yeah. And then Detroit with Iggy and, yeah. and, and stuff. But. I know. And we used to hear stories about, from California about, like, the Eagles and bands like that, you know, and... And I liked, I loved those records too. I really did. I mean, the British records were more my, British and the R&B records were my thing yeah. more. But I, I love the sound of those records. I mean, there there were a couple Eagles records that, that actually influenced me as far as mixing and the, the way they treated effects and and just the sounds of them. You know, Bill Simzik was pretty brilliant. You know, amazing, yeah. An engineer. You know? I, I felt like they're come not comeback records, wrong word, but they're like later record from a few years ago it was pretty fantastic yeah and i loved when i read the that the, it was all the same team yeah that's right they weren't trying to be hip and modern no, and do it on pro tools and edit it they just went back in and made a record like it was two years later they knew the what they were good at yeah yeah i really i, I admired that yeah. so many of um older or legendary artists try to sound modern and it just makes them sound 
It makes them sound even date more dated. I know, I know. That's the problem with certain band that I won't even mention. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.